Good afternoon. Thank you everyone for coming. I'm Debbie Lukenbill from Mobius and we are hosting the Zoom track for track two today. Uh, and I am uh, excited to also thank Equinox for sponsoring our closed captioning and our fantastic captioner, Karen. Um, and uh, I'm pleased to introduce to you Andrea Bunsnyman, who is going to talk about how to write requirements, or you can't always get what you want, but you can get close. Take it away. All right, cool. Um, let me share my screen here. Um, I don't, Debbie, I don't seem to have the ability to share my screen. I'm not seeing that. Try now. I just stopped sharing mine. Okay. No. Pin video to second screen? No? Hmm. Technical difficulties, y'all. It's probably all my fault. Let's see. Yeah, I'm not, I'm just not seeing an, an option anywhere to, um, to go my screen. The mm -hmm. bottom or the top menus on your screen, I'm not seeing it. Now I see a participants, chat, show subtitle, record, Q&A. Uh, all panelists should have sharing. Let's see. Sorry, you guys. Hmm. All panelists have the ability to share. I can try making you the host and see if that works. Sure, why not? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, there you go. Okay. Hmm. I have more options now, but. Mine was a big green button at the bottom next to chat. Yeah, I don't. Aha, it is there, you guys. <laughs> How many librarians does it take to figure this out? Okay, I think, um, I think we're good. Are you all, can you all see my screen? How to write requirements? Yes. Cool, sorry about that. Um, right, so um, let's roll. So for those of you uh, who don't know me, my name is Andrea bunt Snyman, and I'm the project manager for software development at Equinox and um, longtime Evergreen community member. So um, today I'm going to talk about some of the best practices for how to write software requirements. Just as a note, if you attended um, my talk in March with the cataloging working group, this is pretty much the exact same talk. So if you, if you attended that one, this is going to be a lot of the same content. So I just want to let you know. So why are requirements important? Um, I'm going to start with a quick story. A lot of us probably remember this happening uh, in real time, but in 1999, the Mars Climate Orbiter burned up upon atmospheric entry. The cause of this was traced to Lockheed Martin's failure to convert English units to metric units um, in its software, while NASA software was assuming metric units. Uh, the error, uh, combined with misplaced assumptions, proved to be fatal for the spacecraft. Uh, NASA followed its own requirements, but Lockheed Martin did not. However, NASA assumed that the requirements had been read and didn't double check. So what's the lesson? The lesson is that there are negative consequences to poor requirements communication. Uh, fortunately, in the library world, these consequences are not nearly so dire, but uh, an understanding of the requirements process and how to work through it is important if you're going to be involved with library software development. So here's um, a brief outline of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, 
pretty much go through all of these things and I'll give you some time to ask uh, questions at the end if you're not tired of hearing about requirements by then. So first thing when you're thinking about requirements is uh, kind of beyond bug reports. Um, bug reports are a great way to start making software better, um, creating them, commenting on them, adding heat. Um, but And bug fixes versus full development is really more of a degree of difference rather than kind. Um, software development, uh, excuse me, sometimes development items are more like wants, like more wish list items than needs, but that's also can be a pretty fine line. Um, there are differences between the two in terms of effort, uh, process, etc. And larger improvements require larger dev, they require more development. Um, fitting new development into an, a mature software product like Evergreen can actually be quite tricky. There's a lot of potential pitfalls, uh, permutations, and no one person knows everything about um, Evergreen, not even, not even Galen. So uh, larger development means more decisions and more avenues for misunderstanding. So how do we, how do we navigate this and mitigate this misunderstanding? The steps in a development project um, can be broadly grouped into two sections. There's the defining and researching section and the coding and execution section. For this presentation, I'm really going to be talking about the first half of this process. Development starts from an idea or a problem needing a solution. Uh, why do you want the new feature? What problem are you trying to solve? Requirements, which is what I'm going to get more in depth about today, uh, is about what you specifically need the new feature to do. What a specification does is it takes the why and the what and it translates that into how. Um, at Equinox, when we do a specification, this can include detailing new or changed interfaces, middle layer code, database changes, upgrade considerations, and things like that. Once you've done this early work, uh, the coding can actually begin in the development phase. This is followed by testing, internal testing, external testing, community testing, uh, and the community acceptance and release process. That is a whole presentation in and of itself, and I'm not really going to be getting into that today. So what do I mean by iteration? Um, and first of all, there's a big caveat here. Uh, iteration is desirable but not always possible. Um, each of the six steps in the preceding slide and the sub steps within them should have some kind of internal feedback loop of discuss, revise, refine before you move along to the next step in the process. Ideally, this involves lots of communication between libraries, uh, library workers, librarians, and uh, development staff. One of the biggest problems I see in requirements is over-specifying technical, implement technical implementation details. Um, remember, that's the how part. The requirements are about what. Uh, what does your user need to be able to do? A way that um, I'm gonna to frame this that I will talk about in a couple slides is through user stories. Um, so when you're talking about what you want software to do, abstraction is important. When your requirements start getting too deep into how to do it, you not only constrain the developers who are your how experts, but you're also running into the ever increasing risk of asking for <laughs> things that are actually impossible. Stepping through workflows um, is part of what. Referring to specific API calls starts to get uh, more into a how. So you want requirements to be atomic. A requirement statement should cover one thing. Uh, correct which means possible related to extant interfaces. If it's referring to an existing interface, make sure that interface actually exists. Um, unambiguous, so you want them to be clear, concise, avoid vague uh, language, use defined terms. If you're not sure that these are defined terms, define the terms in your, in your requirements. Um, and testable, so the tests will harken back to those user stories. Since requirements are problem statements, uh, they should also be task or goal oriented. What are you trying to do? This is an element of user stories. Requirements matter because they're a communication tool. 
they help create shared understanding among end users, uh, contracted parties, developers, testers, project managers, that's me. Um, and they give this diverse group of stakeholders, uh, hopefully clear set of parameters with which the project will go forth. And when they're well written, um, they will help alleviate further misunderstanding and arguments and will mitigate uh, unhappiness among one or all of those stakeholder groups. So this is where uh, you all come in if you're, if you're listening from a non-technical perspective here. Um, one of the biggest sources of bad requirements is not understanding what the actual end users need and instead assuming what they need. And this harkens back to uh, things that John talked about in the keynote earlier this afternoon. Uh, anyone who writes end user requirements without talking to several actual real life end users uh, is doomed to fail or at the very least make things much harder on themselves. Uh, actual end users um, on the requirements writing team is even better, particularly if they have specific expertise in the area that you are covering. You wanna to talk to CERC people for your CERC requirements. You wanna to talk to catalogers for your cataloging requirements. So in order to write requirements, you have to gather requirements. You gather them by, and I know this is shocking, talking to people. Um, this should be a collaborative process. Step one is define the scope. It's really tempting to say, I wanna do all of the things, but setting a clear scope and objective for your development project is critical. Focus on one specific set of related actions. Um, an example that I'm gonna use in the next slide is, a Wikipedia style edit log for catalog records. Um, for user stories, you want to f use these to frame uh, your requirements. An actor doing an action to achieve a defined objective. These should be as atomic and specific as possible, though it's uh, likely for a user story to actually contain several individual requirements. Once you have several of these together, you can start grouping them into multi-step workflows or figure out their position within existing workflows. This is a really useful framing device. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about it in the next slide. Um, manage your expectations. So a joke that we have here at Equinox is that the gospel according to Mike Rylander is through development, all things are possible. But there are two Andrea and I'm in corollaries to that. The first one is don't use development to solve uh, a training or policy problem. And the second is speed, price, quality, pick any two. You wanna manage your own and others' expectations that the development will solve all of the problems that ever existed. Though it should be noted, the clearer your requirements are, the more likely your expectations are to be met. So knowledge gaps. Little knowledge is a dangerous thing. One of the biggest pitfalls in overspecifying requirements is that you probably don't know everything you think you know. That's why requirements really should focus on that what, what you want to do. When you drift off into how, it becomes far too easy to fall victim to incomplete knowledge. This is, this is okay, like this isn't a failing of, of, of any of us. Evergreen is really complex software with a long development history. Um, and you're hopefully dealing with experienced developers who know more about how to make your what happen. So reality check. Um, in constraint with the above two bullet points, constrain yourself to reality. I'm sorry for being a big bummer about that. Um, think about your needs, your budget, your timeline, and how these interact with your requirements. Um, also think of the larger project. Does what you're doing interact with other parts of the software? There's more than one set of users and more than one kind of workflow. Make sure you're not excluding other approaches. The goal of everyone in this process should really be to produce working software. Um, software that is perfect and always is not realistic. So I'm really sorry guys, big bummer for me too. Um, so requirements can also either be functional or non-functional. Functional requirements are related to specific actions and workflows and non-functional requirements are ancillary to actual use cases and include things like must include documentation or must integrate with evergreen testing utilities. Those are two common non-functional requirements that I see a lot. Um, finally, like I said before, talk to other humans. Talk to community members, talk to staff developers if you've got them. 
or people who are familiar with the code. Um, talk to other people in the same staff roles. As John uh, Rempel noted earlier today in his keynote, get a range of people to provide input. If you're designing for accessibility, talk to people who use accessibility tools. Um, listservs and community working groups are great channels for soliciting input. Remember also that open source uh, abhors a vacuum and your specific workflow might not be the same as others specific workflow. Requirements for development should consider the software as a whole as well as your specific needs. So I do want to spend a whole slide on user stories because I think it's a very helpful framing device to get um, to that what I want to do angle. I've laid out the general form of a user story on this slide. Typically it's who wants to do what and the why is helpful but not necessary. This is um, a real world example. It's not a perfect example, but it's a pretty good one. And it's one um, that I was able to dig up from Launchpad. Uh, Jeff Davis of BC Co-op helpfully broke down the larger desire of Wikipedia style edit log for catalog records into a set of actual specific requirements. And I reframed the first of his requirements as a user story. Um, atomically, this is actually four requirements, page display, chronological display, user display, timestamp display, but all of them are correct, testable, unambiguous, and state what you want to do and why. The user story is a way to focus on workflow outcomes and processes um, without letting yourself get bogged down in the details of how to develop that. Note that the user story doesn't refer to specific permission calls, table names, really finicky display detail specifics outside of we want, this is what we want to be displayed so we can track who edits this record. So that's, I think, a pretty good example from the extant um, Evergreen Launchpad site of, you know, of a user, a requirement that can be framed as a user story. So you've gathered all of your user stories, you've gathered your requirement needs, and now you can start translating those into actual requirement statements. Requirement statements should be stated in the positive. You want to say the software shall or the feature shall versus shall not. Your language should be as clear and unambiguous as possible. If you can, have several different stakeholders uh, read the requirements and see if everyone reaches the same conclusion. If they all read what you wrote and you get a couple different iter variations of what you were trying to say, that's a good hint to go back and edit and revise. Um, define your terms. You don't want to make people assume what you're talking about, nor do you want to assume that they know what you're talking about. Um, make sure you are clearly referring to a specific interface. Uh, this can be hard in Evergreen because there's not necessarily canonical names for all interfaces. Um, and sometimes developers know interfaces by different names than an end user would put on them. So the web client, if you're in the web client, cite the actual URL. Like most web client interfaces have a unique URL to identify them. Say, you know, give the URL for the patron edit interface if that's what you're talking about, just so it's absolutely clear what you're talking about. And remember, keep focusing on that abstract, the what, rather than the implementation. You wanna make sure that your user stories and your requirements point to things uh, which are testable. Uh, walking the tricky line between, or excuse me, walking the line between abstract enough for um, a requirement but specific enough to test is a little bit of a tricky line to walk, but vague statements don't help anyone. You want to check in frequently against your scope definition that you set before and make sure you're not wandering off course for what you want to do for this project. You want to make sure that you consider potential errors in your workflow, uh, either user errors or software errors. What do you want the system to do if it encounters an error? Uh, while testing can never account for all of the real world ways in which normal humans can break software or in which software can break itself, uh, thinking about how you want to ha handle errors or faults is important and can be, instructed, can be instructive in clarifying user stories and workflows. There is no perfect user, trust me. Um, 
you can consider using identifiers in your requirements so that stakeholders can refer to requirement 3.b.1 or something like that. Um, and remember, if you're struggling to describe something in words, uh, a wireframe can be really helpful. Sketch out large interface elements to either clarify your thinking or to illustrate your thinking to others. Um, but just as a note of caution, don't become too tied to wireframes. They're meant to you know, illuminate a requirement. The requirements themselves should contain the definitive version of what you want. So this, um, I said a lot of words in the last slide. This is the short picture version of all of those words that I said in the last slide. Um, at all of these individual steps, remember that you should be communicating uh, with your stakeholders and working through that iterative feedback loop of discuss, revise, and refine. So this is also a summary of what I talked about in the preceding few slides. I'm not going to read every bullet point, but this gives um, sort of a, you know, the word version of what makes requirements good and bad in my, in my not so humble opinion here. So the previous slide I showed you the good and the bad, and now I'm gonna show you the ugly. Um, so, why are these ugly? Some of them, some of them look sort of good, but they lack context or other details. Um, some of them are vague and untestable. You know, what does, what does easy to use mean? What does robust mean? You, you need to think about these things in a more concrete, um, specific way and, and spell them out a little bit more. And then some of them are actually impossible. Don't write impossible requirements. So in conclusion, good requirements um, are clear goals, which make for happy developers, happy users, happy everyone. It's the key to happiness, you guys. Um, and remember, since this is library software, um, at the very least, we will not have to worry that poorly communicated requirements will result in the loss of a very expensive orbiter. Win-win, right guys? All right, I managed to crack through those slides in almost record time. I think the last time I gave this presentation, I went almost 10 minutes longer. So I apologize if I was speaking too quickly, um, but I'm happy to take questions. If anyone's got questions, um, please use the chat box. Let me see if I can pull that up, cool. Yes, thank you, Debbie, for echoing don't use development to fix a training problem. That's like practically my motto. Um, if you've worked with me on software development, I might have literally said those words to you at, at some point. Okay. Well, um, I'll give everyone another minute or two to if they're if they're furiously typing their burning questions about requirements and then um, otherwise we'll sign off and let everyone go 30 minutes early especially our host and thank you Debbie for doing such a great job hosting and Karen for captioning well, thank you Alrighty. Do we have an evergreen standard place to post these types of things? What types of things, Blake? Slides? Requirements guidelines? I want to be clear that I'm speaking, this is not, I'm not speaking officially for the evergreen community um, about what makes for good requirements. This has just my, been my experience as a, as a project manager at Equinox. Oh, requirements of a new feature. No, um, we don't have a evergreen standard place to post these kinds of things. There are some words about this on the wiki. Um, I think Kathy Lucier wrote them 
Um, but yeah, not on the actual website. Um, of course, the presentation will be posted on the website with all the other presentations. Um, but yeah. What can we do to encourage specific and clear uh, requirements on Launchpad? Okay, that's like, that's a huge question. <laughs> Because Launchpad is often a way where new community members um, start to get involved with, with filing bug reports. And I and others have talked over the years about what makes for a good bug report. And there's actually um, a good deal of similarity between what makes for a good bug report and what eventually becomes good requirements, which is that you're clear, you, you are workflow focused, um, you are concerned with, with like reporting the facts on the ground and you know then also what you would like it to do to be fixed so encouraging specific clear requirements on launchpad is is really just getting people to frame like i really like i, I hate to keep hammering like this user story things and it's it's an agile development concept but we don't really do like a full agile development framework at Equinox, but this concept, the user stories concept, definitely comes from agile. And I think that's a really useful framework for end stories. And it's similar to what makes for a good framework for bug reports. Like bug reports, we ask people, what were you doing? What happened? What did you expect to happen? Like that's the basic framing for, for bug reports. And then for, you know, requirements, the user story is, you know, I want to do X, because I, you know, this particular context of user, like I, a cataloger, want to be able to do a thing because of this reason. So having that, that framing device um, and maybe asking clarifying questions to try to tease that out if people aren't framing it like that. And just being careful of ambiguities. Like it's very easy for non-technical people, and I include myself in that statement, absolutely, to to, to get a little hand wavy, like this is as much an instruction for me as for everyone else, you know, don't, don't get hand wavy, like think clearly about what you actually want, like frame that as an atomic specific element. So that's a great question, Mike. Thank you. Um, Meg, this, oh, this, Meg says this presentation makes a great proofreading document for potential proposals. Yeah, feel free to use it as, as such. Um, you know, we're an open source community steal, share alike, and, and all of that. Um, like I said, the slides will be posted. This is something I think about a lot. Um, it's something I interact with a lot in my in my day-to-day -day work. So, and of course, since I came from the end user side of things as a decade-long user of Evergreen, I'm constantly thinking about that, you know, from the end user perspective, so. Oh. I'm sorry, Blake, I misunderstood you twice. My bad. Um, Blake actually meant a place to post a completed proposal for a new feature. So the wiki used to be the place for that. And there is still a really old defunct page for like development ideas or whatever. But I think um, the standard place for that has kind of now become the listserv. Um, if you're looking for more technical review, um, the open ILS dev list, which we will be either today or tomorrow, Equinox will be sending a message out with um, some public testing information for the curbside feature because we're interested in technical developer feedback. Or if you're looking for general community input, I would say the, um, the general listserv would be a place for that. But there, um, is there a page on the website for that? Hold on, I'm gonna go look like right now. I don't see one. Oh, propose there is a page on the wiki. It's linked from the website. So that's, oops, I just sent that to only Debbie. Let me change that and send that to everybody. There you go. So that is linked from the web page under um, get involved. There is a link proposed development projects, but then it takes you out to that wiki page. Um, it looks like this was last updated almost exactly a year ago. Um, and I 
believe that that project that is listed on there has that uh, course materials module has actually not only solicited quotes, but has moved forward with a quote um, or moved forward with work on that. So that's, that's outdated, but you know, we can, um, you can, you can single-handedly uh, bring it back, Blake, but in all seriousness, um, that is the place, you know, to do that. Um, but since it is probably not super actively monitored, if you're going to put things on that wiki page, um, I would go ahead and shout it out to the, to the lists or even IRC just to, to draw attention and be like, Hey guys, I posted this, who wants to look at it kind of thing. So. Oh yeah. I, I popped, Debbie said that Jane was presenting on the, the course materials last time. Was that the, um, at the student success working group? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I popped into that briefly, but um, I did not stick around a long time, so I did not see that. So yes, obviously that has moved well past um, the seeking quote phase. And um, Andrew, and, oh, sorry. Go ahead. We have a, a question in the Q&A. Sure. Um, development for ability to search multiple languages for bilingual items was done, but requires knowledge of evergreen terms such as item, language, uh, it might be better for you to just look at this. Yeah. <laughs> at that. Well, so there is a staff um, interface way to do that, or excuse me, an OPAC interface way to do that. You can actually, from advanced search, click um, or control click to select multiple languages, like from the interface. Um, the way it translates that into the search box is that item lang SPA, item lang ENG. Um, but for the staff, for the, for the users, um, you can uh, actually do that just from, from advanced search without having to type that specific thing in the box. So you just show them the advanced search and they can, uh, there isn't, there's a, by default, like I don't know if your library has this turned on or not, but by default there is like a, a item language selector, and that is what you can use to do that. Now there's a couple things you gotta do on the make sure your administrator does on the back end, like make sure that um, the correct fields from 041. Oh my cataloger days were so long ago. Whatever the 04x mark field is that that notates the different languages in an item. You want to make sure that those subfields are uh, indexed correctly so that you can search them. But there is a way to do that um, from the advanced search OPAC interface without having to type item lang in there. O for one. Yeah, all the catalogers are, are chiming in. Thank you, Carissa. Thank you, Meg. It was O for one. Um, but yeah, so I hope that, I hope that answers your question. Um, that you, you can do that through the OPAC interface um, under advanced search. Um, I saw that Rogan, yeah, Rogan has a good point about the wiki. It's not used a lot because not everyone has editing access on the wiki and this is true, but it's pretty easy to request edit access on the wiki. So if you, I think, I know that Galen has power to uh, elevate users, I know that there are a couple other people in the community who can who can give uh, edit permissions in the wiki, and I think there's a way to request that um, to just request edit permissions for the wiki. So if you're a community member and you want to do a wiki page, you know, request edit permissions and and go go forth. So um, are there other other questions or or follow ups? Going once. Yes, we can do that, but it's not the same. Hmm. Um, yeah, I'm not, I mean, I can show you. Debbie, if you can give me, if I can get screen share. No, wait, I have it. I still have screen share powers. 
I'm not sure why I was okay. having. I'm not sure why I was having problems earlier. I'm, I, like I said, it was probably all my fault. Um, but let's see. We'll just go to curbside because that's the most recent test system I have. So here is is the language that I was talking about. So you can select. You know, I'm I'm doing click to multi-select, click, control click to multi-select rather, and then um, so this isn't going to come up with anything because we don't have any. You know. Um, so yeah, this puts the language down here. If you're still seeing it up there, that might in the in the search box I think that was actually a later bug fix now that I'm talking through this walking through this interface so what I'm looking at in this curbside demo is is a recent version of master but I think you know there was a it used to be that those sh search terms showed up and that will still work I think you can type the version um, I think, you know, maybe I'm doing the context wrong, but anyway, you, you can, you used to be able to type that syntax in as well. And it might be that, um, that that's an older version. Cause now I'm thinking about it. That was, a, oh, doing or not. And I think you can make it do or, or, and, um, yeah, that's that's just you do and or I think two pipes is or. Whoops, what are you doing? Um, so double and is double ampersand is and two pipes is is or. So if you wanted to to, to use that, I think um, doing it from the advanced search does do it as an or search by default, but I'd really have to go back and look at the documentation for that. It's been um, a couple years since I worked on that directly, but let's see. Where did that go in? All right, so that went into three, one. Here we go. So I guess you're still seeing my screen, but let me see if I can drop this into the, this link into the chat as well. Where's the chat? Um, chat, there's the chat. Sorry, there are so many Zoom controls. Like I am obviously a total Zoom novice, y'all. Um, Oh yeah, Jason Boyer, right. Yeah, no, it did used to do that though. I'm not imagining that. Um, so I think that must have been a bug that was fixed. Um, but anyway, that uh, the link that I just dropped in the chat is the doc original documentation when this went in in 3.1 and so that talks about um, what it indexes. Um, and then down here is where it tells you um, to do, so here you can do or boolean or um etc boolean and so and then on advanced search yes it does apply the or operator on advanced search so there is no like clicky way to to do an and search from this interface but if you type it into the search box using um, the double ampersands and that syntax. Oh, I put a space, that's why it didn't work. So, you know, let's see. Right there. So that's bringing up arias with the language Italian. So if I wanted to do an and, or let's say, let's say I want to do an or. Oh, 
German? Do we have German arias in? There we go. So, you know, that brought up things with the keyword arias that have um, either Italian or German. So, just gives you an example of that. So, and I know that that's not super like end user friendly to type that in, but there is a, a predictable short context for that. So, I hope that, I hope that helps. Exactly. So the person said, I think the problem was in the development requirements not being exact. And that could very well have been the case. Um, I'd have to go back and read those requirements. So Sequinox did the work for that. Um, but it might have been that specific, you know, uh, that, that, was, that that requirement was not specifically stated to have a, a way to do that via like clicking in um, in the advanced search menu. Again, like this is, I am like dredging up like two and a half years ago memories. So, but that's like a very good point and it brings it all back around, which is uh, that, that, you know, if you want if that interface to be, if you want that specific interface element, you know, state it. Like, and it might've been that we talked about it, but it was adding too much complexity because there's also you know that also comes back to constrained by existing interfaces like there's a lot going on in the advanced search interface like where you know you would have to have a conversation about where you're going to stick that like is this going to become like a, a sub menu where you know you you want to say italian or spanish but not german like how deep do you want to get in in the complexity of of what you're doing through the interface and if there's a way for a power user who's going to want to search like that to do it in an existing manner i.e by typing it it might you might end up in a sort of a diminishing returns circumstances but that's again why you want to have specific requirements and talk about them and talk you know talk to your power users do they expect to see that there are they comfortable typing it in a box you know that's a, a good point so anything else? See, you guys got a bonus impromptu demo of, of uh, a feature we worked on two years ago. So thank you for asking those questions. <laughs> Alrighty. Okay. Okay, thank you, Andrea. Thanks, Debbie. And thank you all for coming. And um, hopefully we will see you again tomorrow and Thursday. Um, so again, thanks to Equinox for sponsoring our captioning and for Karen, our, our captioner, and uh, for Mobius sponsoring this track. Good night. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thanks, Debbie.